all there is to the perspective of, uh, um, of electricity. Um, you learn um, in the previous few lectures about current. Uh, it turns out that if I have two current, uh, a current on by a vibration and drop, right? Uh, so the movement of charges. Uh, but the thing that you're is You have two of these in bottom. Okay. Then, then there will be an attractive force in the material. And the force is given by this proportion of the pattern on, on y1 times the pattern on y2 divided by, by the but the distance between the two, okay, r times the length. So the force per unit length is given this proportion of the, uh, the product of the current divided by the distance between the two. And the constant of proportionality is given by this is a unit that you'll have to be familiar with, the event you have to six, um, I'm going to take a word about it for now, by r times r. Okay. And if it turns out that the wire, uh, I don't know, maybe some of you have heard this before, um, the, the current is actually in the opposite direction, okay? So the separation R, then there is a repulsive force. Okay. Um, so, and this is uh, something that, you know, you cannot just explain from this two equation. Okay. Um, Another thing, uh, of course, uh, going back uh, to history, uh, in, in 1820, there's a lot of, uh, already a lot of uh, 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 intuition and guesses that, you know, uh, current electricity and magnetism, they are all related, right? But uh, people, you know, people don't know exactly how they, got, they are related. Uh, the first uh, breakthrough is an experiment by Wurstedt in 1820. That we discuss it yourself. Um, he was giving a, a demo in class uh, with a galvanic current and also with a magnet. And, and what, he, what he has is a, 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 you know, a wire with a current, okay? And um, first he put a magnet going this way, right? So this your magnet, this is the north and south. I'm sure you're all familiar with magnets, right? Magnet has two poles, not poles, half poles. Opposite poles attract. Same poles repel, right? Um, so he was doing experiment um, with this in front of the class. Uh, this is all in the evening, uh, and nothing really happened. And afterwards, after the class is over, he had uh, you know, the intuition to try to do it differently. I don't know why he didn't even try to suffer from intuition, but that's a story in itself. Um, so when he actually aligned the, uh, the, the current with, the, uh, with the, uh, the, the, the poles of the, uh, of the magnet, when he found that this thing swing And if you reverse the current, then it's swinging in the other direction. And and that was in 1920, right? And this is the first time you actually found experimental evidence that there is a relationship between current and magnetic field, right? And, and, and after that, I think they just uh, have a very fast, uh, so, you know, only, there's only 12 years between this and that of the induction. And in between, you know, Ampere's by Sava characterized the behavior of magnetic field, uh, you know, coming from a charge movement. Um, let's see what else. Uh, and we'll talk mostly in between, right? In between is what we'll talk about in chapter 6. How 
this current distribution. Uh, I'm going to jump ahead uh, uh, and not talk about this for now. Um, instead, uh, much later, um, this is way later, right? Maxwell equation is. <coughs> Anybody know Maxwell equation? It's 1850 or so. Okay. And much later, around 1880, uh, Lorenz, Lorenz again, formulated force on a charge, right? Um, Just vectorially proportional to to feel, but it, it goes with the cross product, right? So if I have a velocity like this, right, then the force will be in some other direction. Right? And it's given by some other field that we'll talk about soon. There's a P field here, right? And then what you do, I don't know, are you guys familiar with cross product, right? Uh, if A cross B is equal to C, then you do this right hand rule. From V to P, you give you an F that is actually normal to, to put the, the velocity in the field, right? And you can almost use this. On, you know, this is all done in, the, in, in, in much later, but you can use this to define use this equation. To define magnetic field. Right. At the end of the day, it has to interact with something, it has to produce a force, you have to be able to see the force, right? 
And from there, you work backward to define the magnetic field. Um, and so that was that was what we know um, um, beyond just electrostatic, right? Um, I kind of want to tell the story, you know, in a in a very fluid way, uh, you know, going back and forth in history um, for the back, next 10, 15 minutes. Uh, people are familiar with the at least popularly with the, with the Faraday induction. No, but I think, you know, so let me just tell you a little bit again, right? So because uh, I think that's crucial. Let me erase this. So this is what Faraday found, regardless of what you know about electrostatic and Maxwell equation, right? If I have a magnet, not that cell, right? And I put a coil um, wire, okay? and I jiggle the, the magnet up and down, okay? Then what happened is that, that because it's a, uh, the B field is changing, right? There is a there is a rate of change in the B field that is more explicit. Or something. Okay. Then what you have is you produce a cannon. You get cannon. Right? This is called the Faraday induction. This is the next breakthrough <coughs> after Hoofstead. Okay. After Hoofstead, that shows that there is a, a connection. Carrier can produce magnetic field, right? And in rapid magnet, <coughs> Faraday is 12 years later, shows that magnet produced that. The other, so it's the opposite of that, right? Movement in magnetic field can produce that. Okay. So, So now move that again, uh, move that forward in time, uh, come 1905 to Einstein. So, and he's been thinking about this a lot, uh, uh, mostly because of some issue with the, with the Maxwell equation and, and ENM. But uh, he published a paper, I don't know, maybe sometimes in the spring of 1905, it's called on the Electrodynamic of moving bodies. So if you read this paper, if I remember it, I haven't looked at it in a long time. If you read this paper, the motivation of it, the motivation of it was was part of the induction problem. Suppose. Suppose I have a magnet. Right? And you know, you study more about this, but you know, this magnet produces a field like a dipole, right? Okay. And then I put a coil here. Okay. So there is a magnetic field going through the coil. I move the magnet in that direction, the velocity. Okay. So what happened is that, I you said it is also uh, later on chapter 6, the magnetic field is like a dipole. I don't know if you remember what it is called. Dipole has electric field that is 1 over r squared. Okay. Or sorry, 1 over r cubed. Okay. Uh, same thing here with a magnet, the, the field also uh, increases the uh, distance. Right? So if I move this around, there's a change in magnetic field. There's a because the magnet is receding. Right? And because, the because of the DDT, by Faraday induction, you get cut out. Now. Magnet, right? And this is 
my group of wire, right? And a moving group of wire is about in me. Right? But it's a stationary field. Right? And in theory, we should see the same effect, which you do, right? Because, you know, this is, you can sort of guess this is happening, right? But the way you explain it is different. The way you explain it is different here. It's not parallel induction. Okay. Here, the way you explain it is Lorentz force. Turns out uh, this is uh, independent of frame. You know, there's nothing in Maxwell equation that says that there is a, there is a, 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 a preferred uh, reference frame. So Einstein was thinking, well, what if you know he's the master of thought uh, uh, experiment? But he probably invented thought, thought experiment. So what if he's running at some v equal to the speed of light? Right? 
by the way, this is uh, this wave is a wave at the speed of light, right? If 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 you are running, this is what you can probably thought. So if he's running at the speed of light, then he will see that this wave and, and him stationary. The wave is not moving. Right? You have this thing almost like a, you know, just like a picture of a of a of an undulating string, right? It's not moving. And that cannot be right, said, because it will, it's a violation of Maxwell equation. Maxwell equation tells you that this wave has to be moving. Right? So something is definitely wrong. Right? So that, that was uh, how the actually originally thought about this. Uh, uh, somehow, right, this idea of Galilean velocity transformation is not right, right? Because what, you know, what he's doing is Galilean transformation, right? So if, if light is moving at velocity p, if I run at the same velocity, then the light should be stationary. Right? So uh, something is wrong with that. Uh, 
or we actually put it as a second postulate that is in applied in any frame is the same. No matter what frame you are, the speed of light is the same. So this in itself already tells you that you know that this contradicted Galilean and velocity transform. So that it must, uh, it, uh, 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 as a consequence of this, by the way, um, plus the transformation is wrong. Okay. So, um, <coughs> the, the, the standard way to, 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 to teach ENM is not the Purcell way. Usually you go through magnetism, you show Maxwell equation, right? and at the end of the day, after you have Maxwell equation, you show that Maxwell equation satisfy positive magnetism. So it's an American uh, name in 1909 or something. So that, that was not a derivation by Parcells. Uh, um, that was actually done by, uh, anyway, I don't want to go through this, uh, uh, some guy called uh, uh, um, Page, I think, uh, in America. Uh, so that's what we want to do here. Uh, we get the consequences of relativity just on electrostatic and see where it takes you. Right. So it's working backward in a way. But in a way, you can also think of this as, a, well, I, uh, as trying to make sure that relativity can flow with everything else that you've done so far, even before mass communication. Can you explain that all the time? So instead of just, I mean, we already know by now. This is just for the particular uh, exercise. Right? We already know that Maxwell equation is relativistically invariant. That Maxwell equation already satisfies postulate number one. So in that sense, you know, whatever I'm doing for the next uh, two lectures point this. <laughs> but you can look at it differently. It's pedagogical for you guys to learn uh, how relativity fit into electrostatic. And secondly, you see this, which I just found out from reading your textbook uh, uh, by Purcell, is that uh, uh, in, you know, like right after the discovery of special relativity, right, there's all this experimental confirmation that we want to talk about, but one thing that got overlooked, which is uh, something that was published by somebody from America in 1909, 1907, uh, is that, well, if relativity is correct, right, what is the consequences with electrostatic? And then that became the chapter five of Purcell. Okay. So Purcell wasn't the first person to do that. Um, so with that in mind, the first thing is, if you look at electrostatic, what's the most important thing? What's the most important thing in electrostatic? What? The most important thing is charge, right? Ah, okay. So I guess. You guys are confused. Like, where is this going? How do we get the equation yet? Yeah. Um, so the, the, the first example of relativistic invariance that we encounter uh, 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 in this class is the invariance of charge. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Um, think about it this way, right? Uh, this is also in Brazil. If I proton, proton, electron, electron, okay. it has some velocity. Okay. And, and this is uh, 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 the universality of judgmentality. Universality of judgmentality. Is established to one part, you know, one part in in the same frequency, right, or more. So perfect cancellation between charges. Okay, and and this is independent of motion. Okay. Think about it this way: I proton, proton, electron, electron. It's neutral. Okay, you're moving slowly. Okay? And somehow, one way or another, I generate a nuclear uh, fusion. Okay? Fusion reaction, where it becomes the proton get bounded into each other, and then the electron, the two electrons, we talked about this before, in one of the whole parts of the other helium. Right? Now, in the helium, the proton are lightly bounded. And it's moving relativistic. The energy is like in the negative electron forms, right? This is the reason that you know you, you, you can get the uh, the more nuclear bomb out of this. Okay? Because of the, 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 there's a lot of electrostatic energy built in into the nucleus, right? And it's given by like, something like that big, right? And and helium is still neutral. The neutrality is independent of the velocity. I can start with something with low velocity, fuse them, okay? and it, 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 the, 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 the charge is getting neutral. Okay? So that's the first thing. Okay? Um, so if charge is neutral, one neutral, if charge is invariant uh, between frames, then in this case, we don't want to be looking at Coulomb's law. It's difficult to use Coulomb's law. We want to be looking at the cross. If I have some row, just right? And I have a, a Gaussian surface S, and there's another Gaussian surface S prime, right? That the envelope is uh, is just to be true. Then, then the, the invariance of charge tells you that. If I integrate over over the closed surface, right? I don't use this. If I integrate over over S, right, O D B, right, it should also give me an integral of rho prime D B prime over S prime. Right? And these two frames can be moving with respect to one another. Right? S prime can be moving with respect to S. And then I still have that. Right. This is just invariance of charge. And as a consequence of this, when you look at your Gauss law, right, then what does it tell you? That this integral here, E V A over S, okay, has to be equal to the integral of E prime, E A prime over S prime, right, within the two frames. Okay. So that's, this is the first consequence. Okay. Um, but when you mean the surface, they can be moving, um, yes, but they can't uh, uh, not this. envelope each other. So correct, they separate. Correct. So I have one. I have uh, my judgment here, right? Below the surface, yeah. right? Or S, stationary in the lab frame. Okay. It's stationary to you. It's a, I suppose that, that the charge distribution can be moving around, yeah. right? As, as, as long as it's always confined within S, right? So make sure that your envelope is big enough, right? 
And then you take another envelope, S prime, that also envelope your top distribution, and it's also big enough, right? So that's always confined, right? But S prime is moving at some velocity p, right? And in that, if you're sitting on S prime, right? Yeah. Imagine there's a lot of, there's a, in relativity, there's a lot of hot experiment, right? So imagine you have a lot of little guy here, right? Sitting on S. And every single little guy measure the flux. E, 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 uh, all around S, right? And at the end of the day, report the result to the boss somewhere sitting inside, say, right? Um, the PI, say, is the register. <laughs> okay. And then you do the same thing, right? On S prime is another uh, uh, envelope. Uh, you have a lot of people sitting at the edge of the frame, uh, right? And it's measuring E prime everywhere, right? Along S along the S prime frame while this thing is moving. But according to people sitting on S prime, they're not moving, right? Mm -hmm. They can always measure the the, uh, the, the electric field at, at some particular time, right? And we don't have to worry, uh, we can be more cavalier here if we make sure that S is big enough, S prime is big enough, so that the charge is always inside. Right? No matter what happened during the movement, the charge is always inside, right? So when you do all that, it, because of the invariance of charge, this integral has to be the same. Right? Okay, so that's the first consequence. And this is actually pretty interesting because, because now back to relativity again, I know this is kind of schizophrenic, um, back to relativity again. And I'm sure you've learned this uh, before in your, I don't know, popular, popular physics uh, reading, whatnot. Um, so let's stop here from the static point, right? I want to now move on to relativity. What are the few things that you know about relativity? Special relativity? Yes, or special relativity. Yeah, simultaneously. The first thing is that the reason is named relativity. Simultaneity. How do you spell simultaneity? You guess the idea, right? Simultaneity is a, right? So normally you always think of, uh, of things in time is absolute, you know, things that happen at the same time in one frame, then it has to happen at the same time in another frame, right? That's the first thing to go because of relativity, right? In fact, that's the name of it. Einstein didn't like this name. He wants to call it the uh, invariance of some kind. In a way, it, it, the lessons of what is in that means, right? All physics should be the same independent of that frame. Okay. But somehow this is the thing that's stuck, right? Because what happened is that simultaneity is, is relative. What is uh, simultaneous in one frame is not simultaneous in another frame. Okay. And, and another thing is what you mentioned on money is like the uh, Yes, that, that's a one positive that frame. And of course, the most famous equation, right? A equal mc squared, length contraction, the period of length contraction, yes. and dilation. Okay? So, I'm not going to talk about this, and we will talk about this later, but immediately, if you believe this, right? And you go back to this equation. Okay. Then between S and S prime, electric field has to change somehow, right? Imagine, imagine that. Uh, let me this. Imagine that this is your test distribution rho. This is S, and suppose at a particular time, at some particular time not, right, so this S prime is also, is coincident with S, right, they have the same shape, <coughs> and they, 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 they coincide with S prime, except that S prime is moving with some velocity, right, with S prime. Okay. 
then the equation tells you Good. We know from plan contraction, and if you're working with current, you know, you also have time variation. Right? But in this case, just the length contraction part, right? There is modification to this surface element. Right? Because the surface element gets modified. These are all length, right? So this this part of the integral to TA, they contain length. Right? So if the length chain transform from one field to another, the, the electric field also has to transform. But that's a lesson. B prime is not the same as D. Okay. Just as a consequence of the invariance of charge. Invariance of charge shows that the Gauss law, the flux over the closed surface, has to be the same right? from the invariance of charge. But from the length interaction, you immediately learn that the electric field has to transform somehow. And that's what we want to pursue in this, in, 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 in this chapter. Okay? But before we do that, let's talk about length interaction and time dilation. Um, Wait, so DA stays the same? DA is no, DA oh, no. will change, right? DA also? can be length, right? Yeah. DA yeah. is this length squared, right? Since length, the length gets contracted between the two frames, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. <laughs> the electric field has to change. Oh, right, because it has to be right. equal. Because they have to be equal. Right, the, okay. The, the yeah. product has to be equal. Mm -hmm. Right? So that's the idea. But now I have to explain to you about, about some of these issues. Right? Uh, I'm not going to talk about that. Right? We'll talk about this in 7C maybe. Um, but this thing, right? Uh, uh, and, that's not, and this is all of you, you none of you have done have, have, have you done this before? Or, Qualitative qualities, right? Uh, so I come up with okay. like, you know, the, 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 the length and the, the time dilation is actually very simple. Okay. Remember, these are just consequences of that postulate. Right? That's the beauty of Einstein relativity. You start with a very simple postulate. Postulate one, in fact, postulate two is not is almost not postulate, right? Uh, postulate one says all physics are the same, and then. Uh, in, in particular, speed of light is the same, right? And then immediately you get time dilation. And the way you think about it is, is very simple. Uh, uh, suppose I have two frames, right? As usual, I have this frame, this is your frame, the left frame. Uh, X, Y, and Z, right? And then I have, uh, I, I make a clock out of a bouncing mirror, a bouncing light on a mirror. I don't know if you've seen this before, right? So this is another frame x prime, right? In this other frame, I have a bouncing, uh, a bouncing light, right? This is a mirror. This is a mirror, and this is a separate by length l, right? Okay. So the time it takes for light to bounce back and forth, right? You can call that one second, right? And the time delta T prime is given by 2 times L over C, right? Okay? Okay? But according to uh, U, so let's make it uh, easy, right? E mod is staying here, right? E mod is part of the bouncing clock, right? And Charlie is here, right? Charlie is part of the left ring. <laughs> okay? So according to E mod, the uh, here, the, the one second is given by that, right? Put and put one second is given by 12 over C, right? But how about according to Charlie? According to Charlie, C is the speed of light, by the way, right? This is, so there's a black going upward, downward, okay? According to Charlie, what, what's happening is the clock is going like that. Right? Because the clock is moving, right? This whole frame, E mod is carrying the clock and it's moving with some velocity v, right? So, so the time it takes is, is the time it takes to travel this longer distance, right? And how long is uh, what is this distance here, right? So, 
this whole thing, this line here is what? It's just V times M delta T, right? In this case, now it's in the frame of job, right? So it's delta T, not delta T prime, right? And this is L. And L is the same. And this is not actually, I'm going to take this as given, but you can also show that the line is the same, right? The transverse line is the same. Uh, but I'm going to just uh, swap it under the rug for now, right? And the time, it, and then this distance then becomes, this distance is equal to that distance, and this is just a square root of uh, L squared plus, what, uh, V delta T over 2, right? This is, this is, this is V delta T over 2 squared, okay? Uh, and the time it takes, uh, and then the time it takes uh, for one second uh, to happen, that the P then is equal to 2 times square root of uh, L squared plus P delta T over 2 squared, right, divided by C. Okay. So, um, this, so you have to solve for this equation because there's two delta T here. One is uh, inside the square root and one is outside, right? But intuitively, you immediately see that it takes uh, one second here, according to Charlie, it's a bit longer because the, the light doesn't travel farther, right? And if you solve for this equation, it's just very simple algebra, right? Uh, let's call, because Dima is carrying the clock, uh, so let's call that the proper time. There's a name for it. It's a proper time for the clock, right? Because at, at, the, at the rest frame of the clock, right? This, this, this is the natural oscillation, right? Uh, then the, the T becomes the T prime, the T of Charlie becomes the T prime of the mod, uh, divided by gamma, okay? Um, not by gamma, times gamma. Gamma the T prime gamma. The, the T at the lag frame is just gamma times the, uh, the clock time uh, on the rest frame. Right? So, and gamma, so sorry, I forgot to write what gamma is. And gamma is equal to 1 over square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. Right? As you see, if v is less than the speed of light, gamma is greater than 1. Right? So just as you already know from looking at the, uh, the geometry of this, from looking at the, 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 the figure, there is a, a, a time dilation here. Time, uh, according to you, a moving clock runs slower. According to Charlie, who sees Imad carrying his clock, according to Charlie, Imad's clock is running slower. And that's time dilation. And it's just purely a consequence of, of postulate number two. Right? It says that speed of light is always the same. It, it doesn't matter what frame you walk. And immediately you get this. Right? Um, I only have one minute. Uh, I don't know if I can tell you, but simple way to understand length and time. Um, so I don't think I have. So let me instead just say this, right? So that Galilean transformation, I'll, I'll talk about length and the first thing Monday morning, it on 10 minutes. Part, if you want to be, if you want to be uh, 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 a dance, if you want to be more careful, you have actually have to show that this is true. Right? But for now, let me just take a few that in the orthogonal direction, there's no changes in the length. Right? Um, here, you know, this is wrong, right? And here, this is also wrong because we discussed the length transformation. Um, but uh, we want to make sure that uh, uh